Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Beau Bernier Frank and I'm an emerging artist based out of Pacific Grove slash Big Sur. In today's uh, little video, this is an Instagram Live that I recorded and saved. As usual, the format is gonna be vertical since that's the only format that it comes in on the platform. In this one, I actually start out by talking about six areas of focus that I'm really paying attention on as an emerging artist. This is just a nice little introduction and then from that point on, I go into a QA. and a Some people like to watch while they listen to these videos, but usually what I recommend is that you listen while you paint. So feel free to pull out your sketchbooks, feel free to pull out about, you know the canvases that you're working on and get to work while you listen to this Instagram live hey guys welcome back to my Instagram live thanks for joining if you're coming back uh, if you're just arriving welcome uh, I just talked about six areas of focus um, currently for me as an emerging artist um, the first one was the craft which is just practicing painting really improving my abilities and just trying to achieve a level of mastery of painting and I know this is a long-term uh, goal but it's the first one at the top of the list I feel like without this one everything else after that doesn't really count um, number two on the area of focus is a redefined style creating subjects and ideas that are extension of the thoughts and feelings that I'm having being able to take whatever is up here and express that on the canvas through my vocabulary, through my you know vision, through my ability of mixing paints and how I want to express myself on the canvas. Creating work that is an extension of me where you see a painting and you're like, that's a Beau Bernie Frank painting. That's what I mean by redefined style. Um, hype was the third one on the list. Um, this is getting other people involved, getting them excited about the work that you're doing, getting a conversation started around your work where people are talking, people are sharing, people are inviting others to see what you're doing. Um, without hype, there is no um, funnel to your work. There is no you know, avenue of people going to see what you're working on, what your latest projects are like, um, you know, wondering what's gonna be next on, on the horizon. Uh, representation is being able to showcase your work in different spaces, being able to collaborate with either companies or galleries to um, to talk about what it is you're doing, to share the work that you're doing, um, giving it an opportunity for it to also make a sale. Uh, impact is number five on the list. Um, I think without this, uh, it doesn't really leave an impression. You don't feel like you leave something behind. This in many ways is kind of like your legacy. Uh, being able to help the next batch of emerging artists, being able to contribute whatever knowledge you have, you know, from your amount of experiences, um, you know, not just being uh, someone who does the work, but also shares how it is to do the work, um, not being afraid to help, you know, your friends and your family and other artists along the way. Um, last on the list is sales. Um, being able to diversify your source of income as an artist is a challenge, but it's one that we have to go for and just try it out. Um, there are so many projects that went absolutely nowhere. There are so many investments that I made that you know kind of just like fizzled out and went away. But with each of those investments, I definitely learned something from it. And by making sales, you're able to make more money to be able to then buy more products, buy more paint supplies, um, be able to eat well and travel and pay the bills. So once you finish a painting, it's not done. Now it's time to market it. Now it's time to get the work out there so that people can see what you're, what you're working on, what you're making, and then hopefully buy it from you. So those are six areas of focus that I'm currently working on. And I think it's a great way to start out this Instagram live. So if you have any questions, this is the time to ask. Put that aside. <laughs> um, how's everyone doing? It's a beautiful sunny day here in Big Sur. Um, I haven't left the house yet, but maybe I'll sit outside and get some sun, read. Okay, let's see. Mm. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people typically ask questions about my process, about you know how I grew my following, how I created the work that I've done. They talk about my body of work. They're interested in techniques, tools. Uh, methods, uh, mindsets, uh, whatever it is that you want to know, this is the time to ask. You have my undivided attention now. <laughs> um, how did you develop your art style? This is something that is in the works. It's not something that's like final, you know, this is final, this is all I'm ever going to do. This is the only kind of subjects that I'm going to work on. This is the only kind of method of painting that I'm ever going to 
ever going to pursue. Um, the sense of style that I've developed has been primarily from working on my own, but also paying attention to the market, paying attention to other artists, seeing what aspects of other artists' work I really enjoy, and then seeing how I can take little snippets from each of those artists and then maybe try to introduce it into my work some, uh, somehow. Sometimes there's a painting that I think is not well painted, but then the color palette is just so beautiful and goes so well together. So I try to figure out how these complementary colors all come together to really paint a beautiful story. Um, sometimes I really like a subject, but then the method of how it's painted isn't exactly the way that I would do it. So then I ask myself the question, okay, if I were to do this painting, how would I do it better? How would I make it mine? Um, I think a lot of artists struggle with developing style because they don't understand their voice. Once you start asking questions about your tastes, about you know what aspects of art really attract you, what interests you, what where do you focus your eye primarily on a painting, um, then you start figuring out answers to those questions. And from those answers, you can start to build a narrative or a story or a theme or a subject or a, um, a color palette that really evokes what it is you wanna say. Um, some people take a political standpoint, some people take an emotional standpoint, some people take a colorful standpoint. Um, everybody's vision or what they're trying to express is different, but trying to achieve being able to tell that um, story through your painting, that's the next step. Um, in many ways, my art is simply an extension of all my experiences. It's these little snapshots into my story, you know, little moments in time. Um, these are in between moments typically, things that in the moment I didn't really notice, but then afterwards I look back on it, I was like, whoa, that was a really big moment in time. I wanna somehow achieve a way of capturing that narrative and painting it. Um, since that's, that's my visual medium. Um, so with style, like the first series that I did was the Off the Grid collection. That was an extension of my experience of dealing with health issues and longing for travel. I was like, how can I capture that feeling of longing for travel through painting? And also because I wasn't in the best mindset, I painted these portraits in this very disconnected kind of uh, look. They were somehow, even though they might be looking at whoever is the viewer, in many ways they're looking past the viewer and they're getting lost in their own thoughts and what they're thinking about are those landscapes that are painted in their face. So that was a style in a way of the paintings being black and white for all the portraits and all color for the landscapes as a way to draw you into the landscape. And that was a stylistic choice where I thought having too much color might distract the viewer. But then I also thought as a secondary layer that it's a great way to show you know, a side of depression or a side of discomfort or a side of being unsettled and then being able to bring in some life and some joy by introducing those bright, vibrant uh, landscapes. Uh, for these new series that I'm doing, for instance, like the uh, figures that are kind of looking off the camera and uh, looking into the distance and having these really nice, beautiful landscapes in the background, um, with that whole series, I'm still trying to figure out what the narrative, uh, what the narrative of it is. I don't even have like a title for the series yet because I don't know what it is yet. I'm just kind of painting my th way through it. So sometimes you just have to work and make work and try to figure out a thread or common you know idea that goes through all of them and somehow weave it all together. Um, the first collection that I did wasn't even intended to be a collection. It just turned into one because I asked myself the question, okay, I really like this painting. Why do I like it so much? How can I somehow recreate that without copying? How can I expand from this series while still staying within the confines of working on portraits with landscapes, for instance, for that collection? Um, just taking it step by step and building off of your successes and building off of what works for you in that painting and what didn't and eliminating the things that didn't and building off of the things that did do well. So I think that hopefully that answers your question on how to develop a style. Um, do you spray paint? Um, I have some like Montana cans that I bought to do spray paint stuff, but I just never got into it. I think I have like 10 of them. So it's like a pretty penny for just like sitting on the, uh, sitting on the, on the shelf. Um, I was thinking of doing t-shirts and I wanted to do like spray paint uh, embellish on the t-shirt and so that's an idea that I had but I, I haven't pursued it yet. One of the many unfinished product, uh, projects that I have. Uh, did you go to art school? Um, I did not go to art school but I always, not always, but I there was a moment in time where I really wanted to go. 
I think any opportunity to be surrounded by other artists and an educational setting where you're all kind of in it together, where you like all have a common um, goal of wanting to be a better artist and wanting to learn, wanting to grow. Um, I think they're all great reasons to want to go to school. But then I looked at the price point and I was like, no, <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, what got you into art? Um, I grew up very quiet, very shy, very introspective. And so for me, it was difficult to express myself with words. I, it, it was always really hard to make friends. Um, since my family moved often, I'd always, I feel like the new kid at school. And so I kind of just turned to my notebooks to draw and paint and whatever. And, uh, what turned into a little hobby turned into a passion and, um, somehow later in life I got so busy that I forgot about art. There was a time period in high school where for like four years I barely touched a pencil and paper. Uh, and it wasn't until 2012 that I started getting back into art. And then 2015 is when I really started to, you know, dedicate a lot of time to art and thinking that this could be a possible career choice. Um, how do you determine the price of your artwork? Uh, this is a question that I get asked quite often and the answer I give isn't always the best answer that people want to hear. Uh, it's so relative to whatever it is you're doing, however much money you want to make from your art. Um, for me, when I was first trying to figure out how to price my art, I looked at the art market. I was looking at a lot of galleries. I was looking at how much their paintings were selling for and if my work was in that category. Um, some artists just want to break even with however much money they spend on their art products. Um, some people want to um, sell work as much as possible and so they lower their numbers to make more sales. Um, some people spend more time on their paintings and so they have less paintings produced which means that they have to sell it at a higher price point to be able to make enough money to get by. Um, I guess like knowing who your market is and how much money they have is a good way to start. If you're if your community is primarily younger, you can't afford to charge them high expensive numbers. But if you have access to you know, people that are potential collectors that have thousands of dollars or you know, millions of dollars, money isn't an issue for them. It's like how much they like the art, how much they like your work, how much they like you as an artist as well, because that is a determining factor in whether or not they purchase from you. So trying out different price points is a great way to start out just to see if you know people bite. Offering something that is a smaller piece for a smaller price point will probably sell quicker and then the larger pieces typically take longer. There's a lot of paintings that I've made that have not yet sold that I've painted four years ago or three years ago and some of those paintings are selling now. Um, I held on to those paintings even though people offered me less for them because I knew what their value was personally, like my my association for how much that painting should cost. You know, someone else might say this painting is worth so much more and someone else is like, no way, I would never spend a dime on this painting. So it's all relative. You have to determine what that number is for you. Uh, you recommend any books? <sighs> wow, yes, there's so many books that I recommend. Um, if you... If you go on to my, the, the link in my bio, there's like one section that says Amazon Art Supplies. And if you go to that, it's like my Amazon shop and I recommend a lot of books on creativity. Um, yes, I get like a super small percentage off each book that's, um, that's purchased by someone if they go through the link, but also it's a great way to just have like a list of books that I recommend. I read all of them either, you know, once or if not five or six times, there's some books that I think are timeless. Um, trying to think of the titles and the names right now on Instagram Live is actually really stressful. Uh, there's a book on creativity by Elizabeth Gilbert called Big Magic that I'd highly recommend. Um, it's a great way to look at creativity in a positive light where it's not something that's stressful, it's not something that causes you harm, it's actually something that you can enjoy and pursue over a long period of time, if not the entire, you know, the entirety of your life. Um, there's a great chapter about fear in it where instead of thinking it as something that's like an obstacle, it's just something that's always gonna be there. It just doesn't mean that it's gonna take the front seat. Um, she uses the analogy of being in a car with your creativity and also your fear, but not allowing your fear to be the driver. Like it can't even touch the radio, it's not the DJ, it's not even the front seat, it's in the back seat, and it can stay there and it can whine and complain and try and overthink as much as possible, but it still remains in the back seat you're still in control, you're still in the front seat, you're still driving, even if that nagging voice is still there. 
that's just one of the chapters in the book, but there's so many different subjects um, revolving around creativity. And even though she is a writer um, by trade, a lot of her approaches, a lot of her thought processes, they're all very applicable to artists. Um, there's a book by, I think it's Tom Kelly and David Kelly, who are the founders of IDEO, I wanna say, um, which is like a design firm. They wrote an amazing book that's one of my all-time favorites, which I can't remember right now, but it's David Kelly and his brother. Um, and it's one of those books that I just like read over and over and over again. I underline almost the entire book. Um, it's just so good. And then maybe another book I recommend is Make It Happen. This is, um, I don't remember the author right now, but um, I think it's the founder of the Behance Network. Um, which is a great uh, source for designers to post their work and have other people that are potential clients look at it. It's kind of like an online portfolio website. Um, so this book is all about like how to make it happen, like no excuses, how to create structure in your life to be able to achieve the goals that you want. Um, I think I've read that book five or six times at least. Um, it's one of those books that sometimes I forget about it and then I come back to it a year later or six months later and I read a chapter or I read it through. And they're just like, wow, it's like mind blowing, even though I've already read it. I think it's really good to have positivity come into your life on a regular basis. So sometimes rereading a book isn't a waste of time. It's just a way to remind you of what matters. So yeah, Make It Happen is a great book. And check it out on my Amazon links. There's all these books that I'd recommend. What's your view on artists accepting custom orders? I get quite a bit of I get quite a bit of direct messages about like, hey, I'd love to commission you to paint whatever. Um, and I'm very flattered that they would offer commissions, but for me, I don't really wanna pursue anything that's not what I wanna do personally. Um, yes, I know I'm turning down money, but at the same time, I'm keeping my creativity alive because I'm enjoying the process of making things. Um, I think whenever I'm forced to do something that I don't like, I end up hating it or resenting it. I can do it a couple times and it's fine, but if I keep doing it, I keep giving in to someone else des deciding or choosing a path for me that isn't mine. Maybe that's too dramatic or too extra, uh, extra way of thinking things, but for me, I just don't take orders very well. Um, if you're someone who's like, I just wanna practice my craft and if practicing means also getting paid, I don't mind practicing you know, doing something for someone else if, if, if that's what they want, and if I enjoy making that person happy and making that client happy. Um, but personally, I don't like doing commissions because it takes away the fun out of it. Um, I like working on my own projects. I like building my own things. I like, you know, working on my business. And when I do something for someone else, like a custom order, I feel like I'm building someone else's business. So I don't wanna be known as the person that takes custom orders. I wanna be the known as the person who creates a work of art and if they like it great and if they don't they can you know go off to the next artist and try and figure out someone who will do it for them uh what's your favorite color or color scheme um this one's easy uh i take a lot of inspiration from nature and so big sur has been one of the biggest influences of my artist career i would say in the last few years um there's a very distinct color palette here in, uh, in the local landscape the colors that I keep seeing are the ocean colors, which have those deep marine blues, those turquoise greens. Sometimes there's like little emerald there. Um, depending on if it's a sunny day or a foggy day, it can get desaturated and get more into like Payne's gray almost. Um, then there's the beaches that are right here, which are these nice eggshells and off whites and kind of like terracotta earthy tones when you know the, the train gets um, wet or um, there's a light rain or or when the mist comes by um, there's a lot of hillsides that are covered in shrubs and so there's these like military greens when it's dry and rusty then it gets kind of golden in the summer when it dries up um, in springtime it's luscious it's green uh, there's this you know rainbow of green colors all over the hillside um, and then also if you go into the forest there's these redwood forests that are just breathtaking and if you look at the bark there's all these red tones in there but then there's some I don't know darker tones um the green is a very specific green that you see there as well and green is one of my least favorite colors so for me to find a green that I really like 
um, this area definitely provided. And so I just take those colors and I introduce them into my paintings or somehow, you know, a lot of my photography is local and so I use my photo references and then they end up jumping into my paintings. Do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, yes, I have a YouTube channel. It's the same as my Instagram, it's Bobby Frank. So if you go youtube.com slash Bobby Frank, you can find uh, my YouTube. Uh, there are some tutorials and sense of like how to use certain products or you know different approaches. A lot of it is mindset, so kind of similar to what this is, just answering questions. Um, sometimes I elaborate on a question and it turns into a video. Um, sometimes I post these Instagram lives in their entirety so that people can rewatch them later if there's something that they really liked. Um, there's a variety of time lapses, things like that. Uh, you're amazing, I love your works. Oh, thanks. <laughs> can you draw me? Uh, thank you for offering, but I'm really busy with some projects right now. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, hi from London. How's it going? <laughs> Are you a Sagittarius? I'm a Cancer, so that's a no. Uh, I'm using your work for inspiration for an art project. I love your work. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm usually pretty good at answering emails, but sometimes there's too many and some of them slip through the cracks. Um, a lot of people send me direct messages and I sometimes look at my direct messages, so sometimes I answer them, but most frequently I don't. If people ask me questions in the comment sections of my photos, I typically read almost all the comments so I can go through them. But I like this setting because I don't have to like write a paragraph, I can just like say it and then it's done and I can like move on with my life. Um, but if you have some questions, feel free to ask them on any posts that I make. Um, you can email me if you'd like, and then I can answer them on my own time. Uh, but this is kind of a nice setting just to have a conversation, kind of see where it goes. Sometimes a question leads into another question. Sometimes it just kind of sizzles out. Uh, each time is different. Um, right now, it's such a weird time to be an artist because... <laughs> I mean, it's always been a weird time to be an artist, to be honest, but now especially, we have open schedules, we don't have as many obligations maybe, but we're also maybe lacking studio space, so trying to figure out how to work at home is quite difficult if you don't already have an established space. Um, for, for me, I didn't really take my art seriously until I created a space that was dedicated purely to art and nothing else. Um, that happened in 2017, I'm gonna say. I was using a room at my parents' house that was previously known as the game room. That's where the Xbox lived, that's where the big HDTV was, that's where we'd have parties and you know hang out with friends and things like that. And then after graduating high school and then leaving and coming back and moving with my parents, um, I just had this like game room and it was like purple and green and it was hideous and not inspiring and I was like, I've had it. Um, thankfully I have parents that are very understanding and very supportive of my craft and so they let me redesign it and so I repainted the walls white. Um, I wanted it to feel like a gallery setting. I bought a new couch. I made my own coffee table, new desk new computer, you know, new storage uh, supply areas, um, one area dedicated for printing or like packaging things and shipping things, another area for all my art, art supplies, another area for all my panels. Um, I installed the light above just to have proper lighting while painting. I really wanted to take my art seriously and so I had to treat it like something that I genuinely care about. And I was like, how can I make my life as an artist easier? How can I make it more enjoyable? How can I make it fun where it's something that I look forward to? And so redesigning my little studio space was one of the best things that I ever did. It was an investment having to buy all those things, but I've definitely been using it the most. I barely even use my bedroom because I'm always in the studio. Like literally my, my room is only used for sleeping. I'm never in there. So, Having a space where I can, you know, turn that switch on and be like, okay, now I'm gonna be in the mindset of making, of producing, now it's time to work. Um, that was a big step because otherwise I was always scattered. I had always so many distractions. I could just go on Netflix, I could just, you know, play video games, whatever. 
So I put a <laughs> curtain over the TV so I didn't have to look at it. I got rid of all the things that I didn't want. All There was these two clunky little bookshelf things filled with books that were random for like SATs and math stuff and language stuff and photo albums. And I'm like, this isn't helping me with my art. So I got rid of that. I put it to the other room. I just wanted to make space that really got me thinking about my art, thinking about ideas, giving me room to, to dream or imagine what I wanted to do, and then also take the next step and actually work on it. Um, so that was a really big step. And I think for a lot of artists right now, if you don't feel like you have a space, you have to work within the confines of what you have. And so, you know, whatever it is, if you have a desk, clean your desk, it, it's time to do the Marie Kondo method and just like see if it sparks joy in your life. And if it doesn't, like get rid of it. Um, I just moved back from uh, being on the East Coast and coming home, I was welcome to all the things I left behind, all the excess, all the stuff that I don't use anymore, all the clothes that are old that are just taking up space, um, all these paperworks that are just like all over the place. And so I just like went through everything. I reorganized all the shelves. I got rid of all the things I didn't need. Um, goodwilled some stuff, sold stuff on Poshmark, which I still do made money from it so it's like spring cleaning literally gave me money for getting rid of stuff um and now when i go to the studio it's like easy i just sit at my desk and drink my cup of coffee and i get to work it's not a hassle it's not like dreading to go to work it's just like i look forward to it so there we go <laughs> um have you ever tried office work before <laughs> uh, i've never had an office job i don't think i could survive sitting at home painting and then sitting in an office and working there, I'd probably just become obese over time. Um, I like movement, I like energy, and with painting, um, it's a great balance where I have a job, like previously I had a job as a server, which is very social, it's very engaging, I'm on my feet, I'm running around the restaurant, I'm you know chatting people up, I'm being very vocal, very, I don't know, charismatic, and when I go home, it's like the polar opposite. Everything gets very quiet, everything gets very still. I'm painting in the corner for hours on end. No one's talking to me. Um, I like having a balance. Um, I think if my life was just sitting down and painting, I'd probably go crazy. So having access to conversations, having access to talking with others, hanging out with friends, going on walks, going on runs, getting out of the house, those things definitely help me stay sane. Um, the best advice to be beginner artists? Um, hmm. For beginner artists, it's so tough because there's so much to learn and it feels very stressful. But if you look at it as an opportunity, as you, if you look at it as something that's a lifelong pursuit rather than an overnight success story, the overnight success story doesn't really occur if that's what you're looking for. So you can already kind of toss it out the window. The whole pursuit of art is all about improving it's all about learning it's all about understanding things that you previously didn't know and so every time you work on a piece you learn something and it's like collecting all these secrets and then learning about them and then applying them to your practice and then with each piece you get better and better and better and instead of comparing yourself to someone else's journey and what they're doing and what how much success they have think about your own life and your own successes like if you're been painting for two, three years, like imagine two years prior, that person talking to you now, if they could see how much you've progressed and how much you've learned, they would be super impressed with you. And so I think having a positive outlook on your own journey and on your own skill level, instead of thinking like, oh, I suck because this person painted a $100,000 masterpiece or like, look at this, like it looks so real and mine looks like crap. Um, art is yeah it's a very personal journey and so whatever stories you have you need to tell those stories i think when you're first starting out you're probably just like grasping at straws and trying to do as many things as possible and get your hand in as many mediums as possible and that's the best bet i would i would definitely recommend that um it's okay to copy others when you're just starting out because it's all about technique i think understanding the basic um, structure of drawing understanding how to maneuver a paintbrush just knowing the basics allows you to then work on your projects. I think a lot of young artists have these ideas and it's so hard for them to have the skill level to achieve those ideas. And so your goal is basically just to reach that skill level to be able to say exactly what you wanna say or paint exactly what you wanna paint. 
um, and you just have to be okay with not making that great of art when you're just starting out. But um, definitely celebrate your successes. When you do something that you're proud of, be proud of it. And when you see that you're not doing so well with something, be kind to yourself, but just push yourself and keep getting better. Um, how do you paint skin so well? Um, so learning how to paint skin, um, I guess I've always had an interest in painting portraiture and figures from having drawn a lot of things, you know, a lot of comic book characters when I was younger. Um, translating that over to painting was all about shading. I think when people stop thinking of painting subjects as the subject themselves, as, you know, a lot of people get confused when they're painting a portrait because there's so many different components and they have to play in the right order to make it feel real or to really feel like that's the person they're painting. Um, when you're painting a vase, you're painting a vase that has, like say the vase is blue, it's gonna be maybe dark around the edges and then when it wraps around, it gets lighter when where the light hits it and then there's a highlight. Well, the same thing applies to skin except the skin isn't blue like the vase, it's brown or a light beige or you know a darker color. You're not painting skin anymore, you're just painting this little piece of the puzzle that is the painting itself. When you zoom in close enough to an object or thing, it stops being the thing. It just starts looking like a bunch of shapes and a def bunch of different colors in a certain order to create the effect that you want. Um, I think people overcomplicate things because they think, oh, that's an eye, like that's too complicated. I could never paint that. But if you zoom in close enough, it's just a bunch of lines in a certain way that creates an eye. So when you're painting a skin, I guess the, what's difficult for people is to achieve a level of smoothness or softness, something that's kind of you know, supple. Um, it's not something like that's rough, like a terrain, like a grassy hillside. It's a smooth kind of gradient shading. Um, you can do that using soft brushes. You can use that using like makeup brushes or fan brushes to soften your lines. Um, and being not afraid to blend certain areas and being afraid, not, and being okay with not blending other areas. Um, I think working in layers is a great way and also achieving highlights with glazes is a great way to create depth where you can create that effect of like roundness or um, of shading. So I'd say work with soft brushes. Don't think of skin as skin, but instead of like a color that has multiple gradients within it, um, zoom in into your subject and zoom out. Um, stand back from a piece and come close. Um, use those fan brushes. Um, Uh, please, I'm in need of actual color pencils. I don't know where to start looking. I think the best color pencils on the market are probably Prismacolor marker, uh, Prismacolor pencils. I used them a few times in the past, and I liked how you could, you know, push hard enough to create, um, almost like a filled-in look, because a lot of color pencils are very light. Prismacolors are very intense in color, and they're great for shading. They're a little bit expensive, but, um, they do the job. <laughs> Uh, how do I get positive energy? <laughs> um, I used to be a very negative person, so it's not, um, it's not something that is fixed. It's something that you can definitely practice or, you know, do your best to go in that direction instead. Um, I think it starts with just taking in positive information. I stopped taking bullshit a long time ago, and so whenever something negative happens, it doesn't really affect me the way that it used to. Um, I used to be stuck in places where I have to be subjugated to those things, or subjected to those things, um, but now I can choose my friends, I can choose who I talk to, who I spend time with, what kind of movies I watch, what kind of music I listen to, what kind of podcasts I'm listening to, what kind of books I read. I think learn learning to fall in love with reading was something as well. Um, I mentioned some books before, but those books definitely helped me get back on track and back in the right direction. They're not going to fix you. They're not going to change you, but they will open doors for you. And then you can choose whether or not you want to go through those doors and practice the things that they talk about. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of things that I've learned are from other people. These things are things that I just created myself. I, modeled after a lot of people. I saw someone that I really like and I like how someone can create work that is both beautiful and engaging and intelligent or, you know, 
mesmerizing, but then also I look at the artist and the artist is also kind and generous and helpful. That's like a win-win. Because sometimes people make amazing pieces of art, but then they're assholes and you're like, ugh, it turns me off. So yeah, trying to be kind both to others and yourself is, it's hard, but it's, it's, uh, it's been super helpful for me. So I definitely recommend it. <laughs> um, do you have any pets? <laughs> I don't have any pets. Um, I've actually never had a pet or any living thing to say that I've never had a plant. I've never had a goldfish. Um, I think my family just traveled. So we didn't have, you know, we didn't have that chance or that opportunity. And then my mom liked to clean. So she didn't really want to like clean up after like dog hair or cat hair. So we just never had an animal. Um, both my parents grew up with pets, but somehow it skipped our generation. I love animals, but also I realized that I'm not really ready to take care of another thing like that. Um, I'm still in my selfish years of wanting to spend time with myself and my thoughts and wanting to be able to produce as much as I can. And I think if I had to care for someone else or something else like that, um, it would definitely take a lot of time out of my schedule. It'd probably be very fulfilling and very fun but I don't think I'm quite ready for that. Um, once I settle roots somewhere, then I'm more likely to be like, okay, now I'm ready to have a pet. Um, Cause I wanna give it my attention fully and not half ass it. Um, do you like pop art? Um, I used to not like pop art at all. And I think now it's grown on me slowly over time. I think what pop art stood for is what I liked more about it than the actual art itself. Um, I do like the comic feel of it. Like it's, it's fun and playful. I think people oversell it where they make it so much more than it really is. Like, I think sometimes it's cool, but then people talk about it. Like it's, I don't know, like a, I don't know, not a Picasso, but like, like an absolute masterpiece. And like Rory Lichtenstein, for instance, is very pop art. And I like some of his work. It's very playful. It's very quirky. Um, but I wouldn't say like, oh my gosh, this is like, art gold I don't know um let's see do you have any tips for beginners when it comes to painting or drawing I'm just having trouble with portraits wow um I've I I learned how to draw by copying comic books like I I loved comic book art and so I just kind of copy superheroes and different poses and that's how I learned anatomy um, and I learned how to simplify lines. Um, when it comes to like making it more real, it's kind of like how Pixar elevated um, animated movies into like a three-dimensional object where they added the shading, it added the hair flowing, and it's like a stylized illustration, but in real life, um, that's kind of like a way to, way to express how comic books went, or like animated movies went into like the digital age of like Pixar movies. Um, well, I did the same thing, but with my paintings, I would say, like I used to just do line work, which would be like the equivalency of a Disney movie back in the day. And then over time I started shading it and then it looked more like a Pixar movie. And then now I'm doing a little bit more realism. So I'm making it more lifelike, um, but still retaining some kind of illustrative, um, approaches. If I'm giving advice for how to do portraiture especially, it's all about proportions. Um, and so really keeping an eye on where your lines go in comparison to the neck, to the shoulders, to the body, to where how far the eyes are apart, how close they are to the nose. It's a lot of measuring. I don't do the technical measuring. I do it all in my head just from looking at it and then seeing if it's proportionate to the image that I'm doing. Something that's very helpful for keeping proportions correct is to have the reference image be the same size as the canvas that you're working on. So if you're working on a square six by six, you know, painting, your image should also be square. If you're working on, you know, a four by five um, ratio, your ratio for your canvas and your reference should be the same. And you should use the edges of your ratio of your canvas um, with with the ratio of the cam, uh, with the image that you're using. So some people use the grid method and in many ways I do it internally. Like a, I'll do like a middle line in the, in the canvas 
and a middle line on the paper and I'll see where it is. Um, and then I kind of work from that line to start where I'm gonna put the subject. Um, like you can draw a perfect eye, but if the eye is too big in comparison to the nose, it'll just look funky. So you always have to keep in mind how big everything is in comparison to the rest of the image and then look at your reference image and look at yours. When you have an image on a computer, it's great because you can zoom in and zoom out to get close to the detail and then zoom out for the proportions and the composition. You can see whether or not an image is too far to the left or too far to the right just by practicing paying attention to that. Um, using your image reference um, and sometimes flipping it, it gives you a good sense of whether or not everything's kind of in order. I have an, a mirror set behind me sometimes that I look through, so I'll like paint something and then I'll look at the mirror and I'll see my image reflected in it and it's flipped. And if something looks off when it's flipped, it's just a way to look at your image with fresh eyes. So sometimes like stepping away from your canvas and then coming back to it an hour later or even a few hours later the next day, you'll see things that you didn't see in that moment because you've just been staring at it for so long. So resting your eyes and coming back to it is a great way to see if everything's kind of correctly placed. Also, not being afraid to rework something. If something isn't working, don't just go with it, you know, adjust. Don't be afraid to erase your lines and start over. Don't be afraid to paint over your lines. Um, a lot of people do tracing, for instance, just to get all the proportions right. And I don't really have anything wrong with tracing, um, but you have to know how to draw as well. So learning how to draw is just practicing drawing, practicing composition, practicing shading, practicing all those things that are technical um, because they help you in the long term. So it's like you don't want to cut too many corners, but sometimes it just does save you time. So tracing isn't necessarily wrong. Um, but yeah, if you trace something on the canvas and you paint over it and you lose your line, it shouldn't stress you out because you should have the technical ability to be able to recreate that line, but maybe just with paint instead. So you're still drawing, even if you're painting, you're just drawing with a paintbrush instead. I think a lot of people get stressed out switching tools, but in many ways you're still doing the same things. You're just using different materials to achieve a different effect. Um, what can you use to glaze varnish your paintings? Um, well, if you're glazing, it's different than varnishing. Glazes are these semi-translucent, semi-transparent coats that you apply to a painting to either lighten or deepen or to change the color, change the value a little bit. Um, a lot of grisailles, which are like black and white paintings, um, are fully painted in black and white, and then the color is then glazed over to achieve the color that they want. Um, that's just one method. You just have to use more medium and less paint. So diluting your paint using a blend of terpenoid or gamsol, so some kind of solvent, and then also some medium like uh, liquid or stand oil or linseed oil, those are great ways to create glazes. I work quite a bit with glazes. A lot of my earlier work with landscapes were so many thin layers on top of each other. So some paintings might have 10 to 12 or even 15 layers on top of each other. And it was kind of crazy because now I'm much better at just achieving the right color the first time around, but sometimes you don't. And so you need to change it a little bit without changing everything. And so using these glaze techniques are great ways to adjust mild things without changing the entire composition or color scheme. Um, so with skin tones, for instance, if I create a skin tone that I like, that's the base coat, but then skin also has these blue tones from like veins and reflections and saw, you know, different things kind of bouncing onto the skin. You don't necessarily want to paint blue on the skin, but you want to add a kind of like semi-translucent color on top of it. Glazes are a great way to add depth to skin by adding purples and kind of weird colors without completely covering up the paint. The natural skin tone still comes through, but then you have a nice like blue shade on the back area if it's a shadow, for instance. So glazes are a great way to, to just kind of take your painting a little bit up a notch. Um, and for sky areas or large areas, it's a great place to glaze as well. Um, for varnishes, I use temporary varnishes because it takes usually five months for a painting to cure before I can actually varnish it. And so I use um, 
yeah, what is it called? Gambar Picture Varnish. And sometimes I use satin if I want a almost like a little bit matted look. Um, for certain pieces, it looks better matted. And then for others, I like the gloss. It makes it shiny, it makes the paint look like it's wet. And so I use Gambar Picture Gloss. Um, <laughs> how do you find happiness? <laughs> Wow, um, how do I personally find happiness? Um, I really enjoy spending time with my loved ones. I absolutely love traveling. That's one of my favorite things to do. I love eating well and drinking well. So um, I don't mind spending money on those things. I definitely set a lot of money aside simply for traveling. Um, and that brings me so much joy, which I then take into my other areas in life. Um, it inspires photography, inspires my writing, inspires my painting. Um, painting is something that has been this, you know, passion of mine for quite some time. And so whenever I make time for my art, um, it always breathes a little happiness into my life. Um, I like being outside, even if it's just for an hour or 45 minutes, um, getting some sunshine always cheers me up. Um, reading, even if it's 10 minutes, just reading a chapter sometimes is enough to like snap me back into feeling more like myself. Journaling definitely helps me feel more like my thoughts aren't just buzzing around my head. I can let, let those things sit somewhere else and and that just kind of takes a weight off my head. Um, and I think that makes me happy as a result. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of little things. I think the little things end up becoming the big things in life, but how do you simplify your life into a way where you enjoy almost all aspects of it? It's quite difficult, but I, I can't say I'm complaining right now. Life is pretty good. Um, how do you get inspiration? I haven't painted in months and I'm kind of sad about it. Um, I mean, I've gone through phases of not painting for a very long time. That's totally fine. Um, first off, you're not alone. <laughs> uh, how do you get out of it? Uh, I think you don't have to just do it like right now. Like I can't say like paint and then you'll paint. Um, you have to be okay with trying it even if it doesn't go well so just like trusting that you'll figure it out um getting your all your items out on the table and having it in your field of vision will at least be one step closer to painting like you maybe won't necessarily paint in that session but at least you can see the tools and see what's available um it's kind of like an invitation i would say if you sometimes a lot of times you're like you just don't have an idea you don't know what to paint and so the first step is just having an idea or having something to paint so look through your roster of photos you know find a reference image that you feel like would be a great way to ease back into painting or something that you enjoy don't paint something that someone else might like paint something that you would like um, and try and recreate that um, try with something small you don't want to over you know you don't want to stress yourself out with working on a huge piece that's going to take tons and tons of hours. Maybe just try with a little miniature. Maybe even paint in a sketchbook. Like you don't have to do something that's going to be seen or sold. Um, you can just paint something for you or as a little gift to someone. Um, yeah, there's little ways of just like breaking through cold feet. Um, and for me, those are just some methods I do. Um, sometimes if I haven't painted in a long time, I'll just do like a little sketch or I'll do a little watercolor or do a gouache painting um, and then, or do like a miniature six by six auction piece. And then once I'm warmed up, then I can start tackling those bigger pieces and those ideas that are gonna really take a lot of time. Um, Cause I feel like a lot of people do have that feeling of inspiration I mean, I'm inspired every day in little ways. Maybe it's not the kind of inspiration that you see in the movies where it hits you in the middle of the night and you have to get up and grab a notebook and start working. Um, I almost never get that feeling. It's more like little bursts of dopamine. Um, I hear something that's funny and inspired me to laugh. Like that inspires like a, a change in my way of thinking or feeling. Um, I'll see a view and my eyes will dilate because it's beautiful. I'm like, holy crap, that's a beautiful view. Like, that's it. That's a change in your way of thinking and feeling. Um, you'll go through Instagram and you'll like something. Like, say you're looking through a lot of different images and certain images really attract your eye and you save it. Like, that's telling you something. That's telling you that you like this. Um, when you can introduce things to your life that you like, then you start paying attention to those things more and figuring out what things you like 
and then how to get more of it is kind of the <laughs> the whole game of life um, and I think the people that listen to that intuition um, end up achieving quite a bit of things and they also enjoy themselves a lot more along the way so trying to figure out something that you might enjoy painting and then painting that would be probably my recommendation um are you also a writer <sighs> i've been working on a book for the last year and a half maybe two years i would say it's a visual diary so it's kind of like a collection of essays and pieces of writing compounded with paintings and photography and I've been I wrote it and then I realized that there's so much of it that I need to edit out and cut out in areas that I want to rework and so I've been working on that but I'm also so excited about painting and all these other projects and so I have to choose like which ones to work on and which ones not to writing hasn't been a priority in my life so I've been pursuing it as full-heartedly as I could but there's definitely like a six month to eight month period where I was writing on a daily basis. I was really trying to think about how to express myself and, you know, allowing the words to flow in a way, in the same way that I allow paints to flow on the canvas, that kind of approach. But I'm not grammatically inclined. Like I struggle with grammar so bad. It's just, it's such a struggle. Um, and so I definitely, need a lot of help when it comes to editing. I think I'm really good at expressing myself and talking about subjects, but then converting those words into writing format is like a whole different, um, a whole different uh, experience. Like that, in, I don't know, in English, for instance, like I write the same way that I talk. And so <laughs> a lot of people don't write the same way that they speak. And so I don't really know which one's right or wrong. I just know that this is the only way I know how to write and I, that's that's all I can do. How do you choose when to varnish? Um, I varnish only when I really need to. So if I need to take a photo and upload it, then I'll probably varnish it then. The painting has to be touched dry, but typically I let it dry for at least three or four days before I do anything to it. Um, but sometimes I let a painting sit and dry and cure for six months and then I varnish it. And then sometimes I you know, varnish it three days after it's dry. Um, are you interested in high fashion or fashion in general? Some of your paintings have a magazine aesthetic about it. So it's funny that you say that because I'm obsessed with magazines. I love editorials. I love interviews. I love articles about places and destinations and travel magazines and architecture magazines and fashion magazines to some extent. Um, uh, they're a great way to find reference images, let me tell you. Um, everything's very carefully curated. It looks effortless, but there is thought and intention that went behind it, and that's kind of the way that I approach my art. Um, I want it to feel like it's effortless and nonchalant, but in many ways, everything was made with a careful executive decision um, in mind, and so Magazines have definitely been a huge inspiration for me and when I just talked about writing and wanting to create a visual diary It's modeled after magazines that I enjoy reading and going through so it's like how can I create a book? That's actually a magazine Disguised as a book or a book ma disguised as a magazine um, Favorite brush or brushes I go through so many phases like I have a brush that I'm like this is my favorite and then I get sick of it um, or the bristles get too bristly or I feel like oh this is too soft um, lately, I've been falling in love with the kind of rectangular ones where um, they're long enough that they have a little, it gives a little bit, like the brush will bend. Um, and I can go thick if I go one way or thin the other way. Um, so I've been kind of playing with those. And then I'm a, I have a soft spot for detail, so I like those little tiny brushes. They're all also really cute. <laughs> and then fan brushes are great for blending. How would you explain entitlement to someone and do you think it could be overcome? Wow, that's such a strong question. <laughs> entitlement? I think anyone who's entitled knows they're entitled, but they might deny it. Um, I mean, everyone has some aspects of being a little bit entitled where they feel like they deserve something or they're owed something to them because they f feel that way. Um, nobody owes anyone anything ever, um, but choosing to give something away is 
something that usually comes around. So it's kind of like karma in a way. Um, if you just take, take, take and never give, um, then you turn into someone who's entitled. But if you start sharing and giving, people as a result end up giving back to you and end up sharing with you. And I feel like when you're able to share experiences, it just becomes that much more rich. Um, instead of trying to change someone to be not entitled or to have them accept that they're entitled, start offering them opportunities to be someone who wants to share by sharing with them. I think if you're able to be the person that um, other people can aspire to be like or look up to or you know want to be with, um, they're probably more likely to change. And if they're not, then maybe try and avoid that person or limit how much time you spend with that person. Um, I stopped playing the game of trying to change people because they will change if they want to and if they don't then they don't have to it doesn't affect me the, the way that it used to I used to take things very personally especially when it came to like family or you know close friends but now it's like everyone has their own life their own decisions to make they don't have to follow your rules and there's probably many things that you do that they don't like um, so you know, you don't need to be that problem solver for them. You don't have to be their mom. Um, you can just accept them for who they are or you can let them go and, you know, try and find other people that are more like-minded. Um, would you ever do merch or more affordable prints? So I have some prints that are $25. I think that's as low as I'm going to get. I mean, I just had a sale where there were 20% um, off and some people definitely bought them. So that's as low as I'm going to go, people. <laughs> um, as for merch, um, I have like a patch that's 12 bucks right now, which is, yeah, definitely on the pricey side. But that thing, that thing almost put me over the edge. Uh, I was working with a designer to get this design printed on a patch and I almost choke-holded this designer because they would not get it right. And I sound like the jerk, but I'm like, I had very simple instructions, I was very clear, and they just could not get it. And then finally it got right, but to make this little four inch patch took me like three months. Three months of my life I will never get back. So many phone calls, so many like struggles on the phone trying to figure out how to get this thing to work. And it finally worked, but like I had to fight for that. It just makes me want to like figure out a way to do it myself instead of hiring someone else to do it. Um, but it's also such a huge learning curve to learn how to do embroidery or how to work an embroidery machine. Um, so I'll probably be doing merch in the future. I definitely want to get into t-shirts. That's a big one. And I know everyone does it, but like I have some ideas that can make it a little bit more personal. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best, but um, yeah, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, thank you for always answering questions. Uh, I still love it. Oh, thanks, Richard. Um, painting hands. Hands still give me hell. So just know that it's going to be one of those lifelong struggles, <laughs> painting hands. It, I struggle less now, but it's still one of those things that just, they're just weird. Like, they're just such weird things to paint. Um, and under different lightings and under different circumstances, depending on if it's holding something, um, hands from certain angles are just extremely weird so like when you go like this like your hands are these like little round nubs and it just looks weird when you're up close it looks weird but the further you stand back it kind of all comes together there's a lot of YouTube videos on how to draw hands um, or even just like drawing tutorials on how to do that I mean not the best person to ask about this but sometimes I'll look at an image like a photo reference and the image will be very strong, but the hands will look weird. And if the hands look weird in a photo, they will definitely look freaking weird on a painting. So any painting that I've done and I had an image with a hand that was weird, I cropped that hand out and I changed it to something else, either by using my own hand as a model and trying to get the right angle and Photoshopping it onto the person, or just having someone pose in the right angle so I could take a photo and then paint the hand in that way. But yeah, sometimes hands are just weird. So make sure that your photo reference is something that you could replicate, because if you can't, it's gonna drive you crazy. Um, do you also do photography or videography? Um, I don't do videography. I only use my iPhone for video. So every YouTube video you've ever seen has been done with my iPhone, 
which is terrible. That's why the quality is bad. But um, I use my Canon camera for photography, and I do quite like taking it out. Um, you know, when I travel and when I go on hikes and things like that. Um, so yeah, I do enjoy photography. Have you ever painted yourself? If not, you should make a large cinematic one and make a video about it, documentary style maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's gonna happen. I have painted myself once and I didn't finish it, but I did it. And then I also painted myself, but I didn't paint myself, like I used my, my body as like the outline of a figure and I filled it with like constellations. So I was technically doing a portrait, but you couldn't see my face. Um, but the portrait that I did do of myself is currently sitting in my closet and it's gonna stay there forever. I've never showed it. It's not my best work and I don't wanna go back to it. <laughs> um, I've sketched myself before and that's kind of weird. It feels a little bit too indulgent. Um, I think I find other people more interesting than myself, so I, I don't feel the need to paint myself. Um, have you ever done multimedia art? I mean, I've done some kind of multimedia art, but nothing comes to mind that is something that I posted recently. Um, not really. I mean, I've been doing like wash things and sometimes use watercolors and do wash, but um, I, I think I just like to understand things individually and then maybe if I understand them individually, I can figure out how to combine them, which would be like a fun creative project, but it's not, I don't know. I haven't done anything recently. Um, when did you start to find your style and how? I made a video on YouTube called How to Find Your Style and another one called How to Create a Collection. I think those are two videos that would be very beneficial for you. Um, they talk about how to hold on or jump onto a narrative or a story or a theme or a subject or a sense of vision and then develop it and grow it and cultivate it and really get to understand what it is you're doing and saying and then translate that through visual means. Um, they're short videos, they're maybe five or 10 minutes long, but I go more in depth about those things. And um, when it comes to like finding style, um, I didn't start finding a style until I started pursuing different themes over a long period of time. Instead of just drawing a subject and then going to a whole different subject, I stayed within a certain realm and I explored within a limitation and that really pushed me to like experiment and try new things, but still refraining from going overboard. Instead of trying to do everything and please everyone, I just try to please myself and please this idea that I was pursuing. So like I created a collection of just ink illustration drawings. I create a series of just watercolor portraits. I create a series of just landscapes. I create a series of just, um, you know, interiors. I to create a series of just like tattoo design, you know, t-shirt kind of inspired um, illustrations. And with each series, I realized what I liked and what I didn't like, what I learned from it and what I, you know, what I could do better for the next thing. And as I get older, like I don't have the same taste I did when I was in middle school. I don't have the same goals. I don't have the same wants. I'm not that person anymore. So why would I pursue a series that don't, no longer reflects how I am now? Um, that's kind of what I've been doing. I've been listening to who I am in that moment in time and trying my best to try and capture that um, vision or that feeling. And then once I grow out of it, that's when I jump into the next collection and I try something different or I look back on what I was doing right and then I take that pathway um, so I didn't start really finding a style until I didn't start recognizing that I had a style until later on but I've done all these different styles and so they're all just a combination of things but they're they're still me they just don't all look like me now um, so I think I'm gonna call this a day uh, thank you so much for watching uh, appreciate you guys offering support, offering great, um, great questions. Um, thanks for liking my photos. Thanks for commenting on them. Thanks for buying my prints and my paintings. Um, thanks for being a part of my journey. So thanks again for watching. I hope all you guys are staying safe. Um, I hope you're making time for your art if you can. Um, work on those little projects that you put aside for too long. Maybe whip out those paintbrushes. 
um, do some crafting, make a card for your mom. I don't know. Have a good time. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you soon.